Uh, Dr. Kelvin Dragemeyer serves as the President's Science Advisor and leads OSTP in its coordination of science and technology initiatives across the federal government. Kelvin's background is in extreme weather, numerical weather prediction, and data assimilation. Before joining the White House, Kelvin served as Vice President for Research and Regents Professor of Meteorology at the University of Oklahoma, where he, jo where he joined the faculty in 1985 as an Assistant Professor of Meteorology. In his 33 years, at the, at the University of Oklahoma, Kelvin generated more than $40 million in research funding and authored or co-authored more than 80 refereed articles and 200 conference publications. He also co-founded, directed, and led the NSF Science and Technology Center for Analysis and Prediction of Storms and served as co-founder and deputy director of the NSF Engineering Research Center for Collaborative Adaptive Sense of the Atmosphere. Kelvin served two six-year terms on the National Science Board the governing body of the NSF, including the last four years as vice chairman, having been nominated by Presidents George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and twice confirmed by the U.S. Senate. He's also served on and chaired numerous national boards and committees, and is a fellow of the American Meteorolo Meteorological Society. He was appointed in 2017 as Oklahoma Cabinet Secretary of Science and Technology. He was born in Kansas. Uh, Kelvin earned his B.S. in Meteorology from the University of Oklahoma and an M.S. and Ph.D. degrees in Atmospheric Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, he's also, for this audience, a 2014 AAAS Fellow. We're very happy to have him here today. Kelvin? <laughs> Thank you, Sid. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is absolutely a a privilege and an honor to be here to uh, acknowledge the extraordinary work of our, our fellows. So congratulations to all the new inductees. <laughs> terrific, terrific. <clears throat> the nation is so indebted to you and so proud of what you have done and what you will continue to do uh, leading the science enterprise. Uh, also, I want to thank uh, Peggy and Steve and Sudip and all the folks behind the scenes who've done such an extraordinary job of putting together this meeting. And it's really been fantastic. And I, I love the theme of the meeting. As a meteorologist, you could imagine it really excites me. And in fact, it was one year ago today that I actually gave my first uh, address as the OSTP director. And I'm kind of, and that was at the AAAS annual meeting uh, then in Washington. And so I guess I didn't mess it up too badly. They invited me back. So it is great to be here. Uh, and, and like you, I've had a lot of coffee this morning, and I've been sitting in my chair the whole time. So I'm going to be brief, okay, because I know where we're all going to go as soon as I'm done. So that is not lost on me, I promise. Um, we truly live in an amazing time here in America. You know, our understanding of the physical world, the capabilities that we, we have today are really amazing. You look at the computational facilities we have, the fact that we can pretty much at the touch of a button get access to millions of publications from all over the world. We have the ability to sequence the human genome in, in a very, very short period of time. And of course, we're connected by an internet that truly is extraordinary. We can collaborate across the world, uh, across time zones. And, and what I love about AAAS, it's truly a global society. Despite its name, it really brings folks together in science. Uh, but, you know, if you look at how times have changed, it's really amazing where we've come in the last 70 or so years. Uh, what you see here on the left is a forecast uh, from a weather model uh, back about 20 years ago, and it's kind of blob forecasting. You, know, you wonder where the 20% chance of rain comes from. Well, we're forecasting a blob of rain over two states, you know. You look at what's happened in the 20 years since, we are now forecasting the occurrence of individual storms many hours in advance. And something I'll talk about in a moment, again, in the context of the theme today, which folks thought was actually impossible. So the advances we have made in science have been absolutely extraordinary, and I think you all know that. But I think the other thing to, to point out is it's an amazing thing in terms of where we live right now here in America. The, the capabilities we have at our top universities, we, we have seven of the top ten in the world, hundreds of extraordinary universities that do amazing things, not only educating but doing a lot of research and transitioning those research outcomes into benefits for society. We have our national and federal laboratories, which are really amazing crown jewels of our enterprise, and also private companies and nonprofit organizations, which I'd love to put up there, but I can't because I've learned as a federal employee, no longer an academic, that if I did that, I would be promoting a particular company. So just kind of think of those companies being up there, but they're, they're really amazing. And you know, one of the things that I've been inspired by in my career is Vannevar Bush. Um, 
as President Roosevelt's kind of de facto science advisor before the term really became formalized, he was head of the Office of Science, uh, Scientific Research and Development during the war effort. Uh, I think mo most of you know, many of you know that uh, the President Roosevelt asked him, you know, how can we take this incredible uh, engine of innovation that really helped uh, win the war, how do, we, how do we move it into civil society for the benefit of society? And so Vannevar Bush uh, penned this, uh, this treaty it's called Science the Endless Frontier. And uh, unfortunately, President Roosevelt had passed away in April of, uh, of, uh, of 1945, but uh, he delivered it, uh, Van Ever Bush did, uh, to President Truman. And uh, it, it contained three fundamental uh, pillars. It said, number one, the federal government has a unique responsibility to invest in, in basic discovery research. Number two, those who are returning from the war effort and returning from Manhattan Project and so on back to their universities, we have to be thinking about building the workforce of the future in science. And number three, if it doesn't have to be classified, make sure it's open, make sure it's shareable. So think about that as you know, funding basic research, STEM education, and, and the workforce, and, and then uh, you know, open access, open science. And that's kind of true today. Uh, so Vannevar Bush, who founded a company that later became Raytheon, was a, a real focal point for uh, a lot of what has happened in this country in the last 75 years. In fact, uh, NSF just recently re-released, literally this month, uh, in celebration of the 70th anniversary of NSF, which actually grew out of Vannevar Bush's uh, vision, uh, plus the document he wrote, it is now 75 years old, they re-released it. So if you haven't read this thing, I would encourage you to do it. It's actually, the, the meat of it is very, very short, but it's very inspirational. Uh, and in fact, it led to the four pillar ecosystem that we know uh, today and, and sort of kind of take for granted uh, our private companies, our nonprofit organizations, our federal government and our universities. And when you add it all up, they collectively spend about $600 billion of, of money every year on research and development. So it's, it's a very powerful ecosystem. And one of the things that we're looking at at the White House is how do we, how do we kind of build a more co a connected tissue among these various pillars? How do we take partnerships and, and really take this to the next level while we also continue to invest very importantly in, uh, in the critical areas, especially early stage research? But one of the things that I don't think we talk enough about, and this is becoming ever more important, and we certainly had a session on this yesterday, uh, is, is the, the fundamental values that underpin our research enterprise. The American values of, of openness, of, uh, of, of the, the, the ability you have to discover as a researcher, to chase any idea that you have, to go get funding for it, seek funding for it, maybe start a private company, maybe translate that research into benefits for society. We have a tremendous uh, uh, in, environment here in America, including reciprocity for those who come from other countries to, to, to be part of our enterprise and to, to join forces with us to really innovate and create. That's really, really extraordinary. That's kind of the nation state ethos that we have here in America. But as I mentioned in my, my address last year at AAAS, and it's, it's even more true today in, in my mind, we're entering a second bold era. One that is not begun by the ravages of a war, a global war, but one that has a starting point as a weather guy, I think of initial conditions a lot. The initial condition for this is all the things you see there, absolutely extraordinary capabilities that we have, but also some interesting challenges that we have talked about here at this wonderful meeting. One of which yesterday is research security. How do we balance the openness of our research enterprise with, with appropriately securing our assets while making sure that we are welcoming to, uh, to folks from other countries who want to come here and be part of our uh, incredible American experiment? Uh, also, we had a wonderful session yesterday on sexual harassment. I was so pleased because that's something we're working on, as I'll tell you here in just a moment. Uh, but I want to share with you just a little bit about the top line priorities uh, for uh, this next fiscal year budget, which, which was just released by the president on, uh, on February 10th, Monday of, uh, of this week. And uh, these priorities are top line, uh, sort of you know, broad priorities. There's a lot of other stuff that's important. So if you don't see it up here, it doesn't mean it's not important. But OSTP has a wonderful role with the Office of Management and Budget, two of which are, th these are two what we call components of the White House, to really sort of set this agenda, working very closely with our agency leaders. So the first one is American security, all the things that you would think about, not only military capabilities, but also infrastructure resilience. And where I'm coming to by showing you this list is the theme of this meeting, sort of envisioning the earth of tomorrow. You'll see this everywhere in these priorities if you just look for it. Critical minerals, extremely important, obviously, and, and very important for national security, but also in terms of understanding our geophysical uh, elements in, in society and in the world. Industries of the future, the five industries of the future that you see there, um, the, the president's budget puts a, a doubling of AI and quantum information science over the next two years, and we've been asked 
or will be asked, I think, by Congress to do a five-year plan that looks at a, a spend of a level of about $10 billion a year. Very, very important, a lot of very fundamental research in this, but also what this is going to do, especially AI and quantum, in terms of empowering discovery for the future. Across all areas that we heard Sudip talk about this morning, and all the wonderful fellows, whether it's chemistry, whether it's geophysical sciences, whether it's medicine, the power of AI and quantum, along with some of these other areas like 5G, that will not just give us faster speeds, but it's gonna change the way we think about the world with embedded sensing and so on. It's gonna be so incredibly powerful for the conduct of science itself. So these are really the top line priorities for R&D, and of course there will be a lot of other funding as well. Energy and environment, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit in the context of the, uh, of the theme here, and one thing in particular, that, I, that I'm particularly passionate about is Earth system predictability. Health and bioeconomic um, innovation, very important. Bio, the bioeconomy, we had a major summit in the White House. This is a huge area of great innovation, uh, estimated to be maybe a trillion or more in terms of, uh, of value in the world. So we're, we think about the coronavirus, all the things there, this is a very critical thing. And I think probably biology in the 21st century will be sort of what physics was in the 20th century. Not that physics is taking a back seat at all. When you saw the image of the black hole shadow, it's, it's front and center. But biology is, is really catalyzing a lot of extraordinary advances. And then finally, American space exploration and commercialization. The National Space Council that President Trump uh, recreated, I'm, I'm privileged to sit on that under the, president, uh, under the leadership of Vice President Pence, uh, moving, going to the moon, uh, the first woman on the moon, but as a gateway to Mars. So a lot of really exciting things there. And again, a lot of, of thematic uh, uh, congruence there with what this meeting is about, tomorrow's Earth. It's really exciting. But I'm also excited about the cross-cutting priorities. We put five of these in the guidance memo. And of course, you know, academic uh, institutions look at the guidance memo to sort of see what the priorities are, because these aren't things that change every year. There, there's a sort of a persistence of them. Uh, the workforce, obviously, is extremely important, but this is one I want to talk about in just a minute. Research environments that really reflect our values as researchers, as scholars, as scientists, but also are congruent with our, national, uh, our national nation state values. Um, something we don't do enough of, and I actually had the benefit of this as a, as a researcher uh, back when I, when I first went to the university out of graduate school, was really taking a big bet on a big idea. We need to do more of that. We, we don't take enough intellectual risk in this country to take a big bet on a big idea, whether it's a big center or whether it's an individual researcher. We have to get more comfortable with exploring things that might quote unquote fail, but yet in fact we learn a lot through doing them. The power of data, obviously critically important, and as I mentioned, partnerships. So I want to spend just a second, again, in the context of the theme of this meeting, talking about a few things relative to the Earth. And the first one I want to talk about is, is oceans. Uh, there's been a huge amount of work uh, in the Trump administration on oceans. The president signed an executive order on oceans that created the Ocean Policy Committee. We had a major national summit that I'll talk to you about. And you can see the things there that we're looking at data, looking at the fundamental science of oceans, the stewardship of oceans. In fact, the, the uh, Ocean Policy Committee has two fundamental components to it. One is ocean resource management. How do we manage the resources of the ocean for, for fishing, for recreation, for health, things like that. And then the Ocean Science and Technology uh, Subcommittee. And what, what had happened at the White House it recently was really amazing. We had a summit on ocean science and technology and partnerships. And Margaret Leinen, who I think many of you know, uh, is at Scripps, head, head Scripps Institute of Oceanography, she said, we're having an ocean moment. And you know, you look at this sign that says White House Summit, Ocean Science and Technology and Partnerships, and some, somebody at the meeting said, who would have ever thought we would see this, not in any given administration, but just see it, period. And so there's a huge emphasis on oceans. Obviously, marine debris is very important. Oceans in terms of natural products, chemistry. Uh, ocean uh, in terms of energy. There's so many, many things there that we uh, are doing uh, in the ocean area. So in terms of the theme of this meeting, ocean's extremely important in the context of, of the Earth of tomorrow. Uh, another one er is uh, Earth system predictability. This is actually one that, that I put in the memo specifically myself because um, if you think about what we all want to know, we all want to know the future. We all want to know the future. I want to know the future of the stock market. I want to know where to invest. I want to know if my child is going to, if they go to this university, if they're going to succeed or you know, whatever. Uh, I want to know the future of my own health. I want to know the future of, of whether a country is going to move toward extremist tendencies and become a, a terrorism threat. So we really all want to know the future. And, and so what we start with here is a question of Earth system predictability, the entire system from the smallest scale weather all the way up to the global system, uh, the Earth-Sun system and, and beyond. How predictable are these various components of the Earth system? And it's, it's an extremely important question because 
If we know how predictable something is, it will, number one, help us understand how to predict it. Number two, it'll help us interpret predictions. Number three, it'll help us determine how to invest. If we're fairly close to some limit of predictability in some area, it might even be, say, the financial system, but if you think of the context of Earth, say, hurricane tracks, if we're pretty close to that, we probably don't want to continue investing tons of money in that. We might want to pivot and invest in something else. So knowing how close we are is extremely important. And I'll give you a particular example that, that comes really close to home for me. You know, the, the work of Ed Lorenz, the butterfly effect, the seminal work that he did at MIT uh, many decades ago and really kind of was the father of chaos in some respects. He wrote this seminal paper that talked about how predictable things are. And, and he put out a paper that said, you know, when it comes to thunderstorms, they're predictable for probably 15 minutes. Well, we had a science technology center that, that I co-founded with a colleague of mine, and we said, you know, we think that's wrong. And we think you can actually predict some thunderstorms a few hours in advance. NSF took a really big bet on a, big bet on a kind of a crazy idea. And it, sure enough, we showed that it was possible. So the point here is that the work that Lorenz uh, put out, uh, important though it was, really turned out to not be completely correct in a lot of cases. So you look at this picture on the left, a radar image, the picture on the right is a forecast 11 hours in advance. You're not predicting individual storms correctly, but you are predicting the areas pretty accurately, far, far, far beyond what the theory said was possible. So predictability is extremely important, and there are a lot of questions that remain. You can't probably read the titles there, but this says, you know, have we reached the limit of predictability of X, Y, and Z? And also, more contemporary to today, how about predictability of things like infectious disease? Here's a quote from a paper that talks about, while certain components are predictable, we don't really understand if there are fundamental limits to predictability or to prediction. Very, very important. So I thought it was appropriate for us to start with something like the Earth system, which is not exactly the most simple system, but, but when you think about predictability, there's some fundamental mathematical theories that are beautifully elegant. And then when you move into whether it's education, whether it's finance, whether it's health, whatever it is, they become a little bit more discipline specific. So I think starting with this is the appropriate place and we are actually now creating a national initiative in predictability of the Earth system, which I think will morph into uh, a, a, an initiative for predictability science and its applications broadly across many disciplines. We also just recently released uh, a, a plan on civil Earth observations. So we think about the Earth. Well, this is all of the observations of the Earth system that we need as researchers studying the Earth, not just in terms of atmosphere or hydrosphere or cryosphere or whatever, but, but economists, people in, working in health, people working in biology, looking at the, the biosphere and carbon uptake in the soils and things like that. These observations are so critical. So my point here is that the theme of this meeting, which I think is so fabulous, it's not just about the Earth as a, as a physical entity, it's about the system, including the people in it, which is extraordinarily important. And that takes me to the fifth national climate assessment, which we are uh, moving forward on now. Uh, we brought into uh, OSTP uh, a, a really wonderful person, Anna Rita Mariotti from, uh, from NOAA. She's the climate person. We actually have, we're in the process of onboarding somebody to, uh, to lead the, the, na the National Climate Assessment, the fifth assessment, and we'll be talking more about that. But the structure that we put in place, I think, is really excellent, and it's going to lead to a, a really wonderful, uh, wonderful assessment report due out in probably about three and a half years. So I want to end by just uh, talking briefly about the environments in which research are, are performed. Um, we can have all the funding in the world, we could have all the talent, we could have all the great ideas, all the facilities, all the resources that we need, all the collaboration, but if the environments in which research actually takes place do not comport with the values that we as researchers hold dear, and do not comport with the values in which we live here in America, then I think we really have a problem. There's a mismatch, an important mismatch. And so um, in the cross-cutting uh, priority, part of the priorities memo, we, we had this sentence, I read it earlier, it says, create and support research environments that reflect our values. And this is so important that when, when students, undergraduate students and, and other folks wake up in America, I want them to think about where they're at and also as scholars, the kinds of values that they need to uphold to make sure that our enterprise is functioning as effectively as it possibly can. So for that reason, we created something called the Joint Committee on the Research Environment. And I won't go into the details of why it's called Joint Committee. The main thing is to realize it has four pieces to it. The first one is rigor, integrity, and reproducibility in research. The fundamental aspects of, of scholarship require robustness and integrity and rigor, and in some cases, reproducibility or rep, rec, replicability. And in fact, the National Academies, of course, came out with a study that really put a fine point on what these terms mean. So foundationally, that's critical. Safe and inclusive research environments. 
safe in terms of physical safety, but also in terms of the absence of sexual and other kinds of harassment. Also inclusivity. Uh, we want everyone in the research environment. We want everyone to come there and feel welcome, feel, feel safe, feel like they can vigorously debate an idea but be respected. That's a place where people go to say, you know what, I'm not respected in maybe other parts, but when I go into the research environment, when I'm actually with scholars who are working to unlock the secrets of nature, I am, I am respected, my ideas are valued, I make a difference, and we can argue with one another, but we walk out completely friends. That's, that's the kind of environment that we need to have, and we're not there yet. But the wonderful session we had yesterday on sexual harassment, there's wonderful conversations going on and real solutions being developed, and we are developing them ourselves uh, also with, within OSDP. Research security, again, some of the challenges that we have uh, with, with other nations that don't share our values, don't share our norms, seeking to undermine the integrity of our system and take unfair advantage of it. Uh, we don't want to build tall fences around big areas. We want to take a very thoughtful approach to this, and I think we are. And so I'm very, very pleased. We're working with Congress. We're convening the entire community, nonprofits, for-profits, academia, um, the, uh, the, uh, the, all, the, all the researchers. We're convening the, the societies like AAAS and AAU and APLU, the, the law enforcement, uh, State Department, FBI, uh, national security apparatus. We're bringing all of those folks together, anyone that has equities in this space, and say, how do we address this, including the Congress, wonderful conversations with Congress who are really looking to us to solve some of these challenges. But, but personally, I think these are opportunities, and I'll end with that here in a second. Finally, reducing administrative workload. You've seen the numbers. You know that, that on average, faculty in our universities spend 44% of their time on administrative activities unrelated to research. And uh, you know, I don't know what the number ought to be. All I know is that 44% is really, really high. So we are driving a deregulatory agenda and a harmonization agenda that is going to provide more time for our researchers, whether they're in a, you know, in a university or in a private company, but if they're funded by federal funds, we have got to fix this problem. We are driving this extremely hard. So to me, um, underpinned, should be underpins, all of JCOR, um, values underpin everything we're doing. Fundamentally, the fact that that researchers truly, I believe, for the most part, want to behave with integrity, and, and ultimately this is what it comes down to, especially in research security. It's not about stigmatizing people from any particular race or, or country of origin. It's, it's if you're from Norman, Oklahoma, where I'm from, or if you're from another country, if you're part of our enterprise, we simply say, play by the rules, right? Because scholarly research demands that. It's a code of ethics that we sign up to. And what is so wonderful about that is it makes a strong statement not only to address the challenge that we have right now, but a strong statement to the world of, of what really matters in research, what we value, the trust that taxpayers place in us in terms of stewarding those dollars to do research the right way and make sure that our research is robust and done with integrity because you know what, lives depend on it. There's a lot riding on what we do and we are held in the highest esteem in this country right up there with the military and have been for years. So it's not like there's a lot of problem. I think what we're talking about here is reinforcing this notion of integrity and making sure that integrity fundamentally underpins everything that we do. And if you play by the rules, we welcome you here. And if you are acting with integrity and respect, you're not going to sexually harass someone. And if you do, well, we're gonna help you either figure out how to stop doing that or you're not gonna be part of the enterprise anymore, just like if you falsified a paper. Our nation state values, unfortunately, with other countries aren't congruent with researcher values. Here in America, they are. So again, I think leading with our values, leading with the fundamental things that we all agree as scholars and scientists and researchers and engineers and educators really matter in this, uh, in this country. So where we are today with JCOR, uh, there have been briefings over the past two years, roughly. We created JCOR just nine months ago. Uh, these subcommittees, which are populated by uh, federal folks, but we also, again, convene the whole national community. We've had 15 or so meetings of each of those subcommittees. Over the last nine months, we're pushing this, driving it very, very hard. I've, I've gone out and had regional meetings, had one at UW on Wednesday, or sorry, on Thursday, uh, to talk to faculty, to talk to research, to talk to graduate students, and say, you know, here's what we're doing, but we need your thoughts. What are your experiences? What are your ideas? And we had a, uh, a big uh, national summit at the White House uh, on November 5th, and so now we're turning the page to policy. And we've actually developed some policies. We're working on best practices for universities with all the societies. And then we're also working on educational materials. Because it's incumbent upon us, especially from folks coming from other countries that grew up in an area, in, in, a, in, a, in a system that had very different values. So we want to help people understand what compliance means, understand what integrity means, and, and play by the rules. Because I think most researchers really want to do that. 
When we hear the term foreign influence a lot, it's really not foreign influence, it's foreign government influence. And we value our colleagues from other countries and sometimes they're put in a very tough spot. And so we are going to find the right point, and I think we're headed absolutely in the right direction to balance the openness of our research enterprise, which is so critical to its success, with protecting our assets. A lot of what we're doing in JCOR is getting a lot of attention internationally. I've met with many science ministers who say they love what we're doing. Uh, they think about research security and they say, oh, you're dealing with sexual harassment, you're dealing with administrative workload. Yeah, those are important to us too, because all these things interrelate. You know, if we take some actions to address the research security challenges, but we increase the administrative workload from 44 to 70%, you know, we've absolutely taken a step backwards. So all of these areas interrelate with one another and that's extremely important. So finally, I would just say that I believe that we are going to get this right. And, and we have a lot to be proud of in this country in terms of our research enterprise. But as we continue to evolve and address some of the issues like we're spoken about yesterday with regard to sexual harassment, um, we will be an absolute beacon to other parts of society, other parts of the world. People ask, you know, we don't see integrity in a private company, in a sports team, we don't see it all. Where do you find it? And you find it in research. You look over there, you see that? You see people from different political persuasions, different genders, different whatever, they're coming together to work together to solve problems. And that's, that's what draws them together because science does fundamentally three things. It inspires us, it unites us, but it also guides us. It, find, it helps us find our way through some really tough challenges. So I think all of what we think about as being a challenge, I think is an opportunity for us in science, for us in research, to shine a bright light on, on how we value integrity, how we value proper behavior, and how we're not just gonna value it, but we're gonna continue to exhibit it and take it even to another level. So thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you just a few thoughts. Uh, congratulations again to all the, uh, all the new fellows. Thank you for all the work you're doing. And those of you who are already uh, fellows, uh, thank you for all the great work you'd, you're doing as well. And I just invite you to come and visit me at the White House, come and provide thoughts on any topic you have. I think you all know better than to trust the future to a meteorologist, right? I think you probably know that. So um, I, can't, I, I can't obviously do it. I don't have all the answers, but I know who does. And it's very, very smart people. We tackle problems, we solve big challenges. So it's a privilege to be serving and it's, it, I, I wanna thank you so much for the support you give. I feel it every day, it matters so much to me personally, and I really want you to know that I have open office hours, I, I'm, I'm available. Please come and communicate with me, talk with me, work with me, and together we will, we will do great things, continue to do great things in this country. So thank you, God bless you all, thank you so much. Thank you, Kelvin. Uh, he means that when he, uh, you know, I, I want to thank Kelvin for, first of all, engaging with us for a couple of days, three days. I know how busy uh, the schedules get uh, at the White House, and I really appreciate his, uh, his engagement here with us. And I also know that he does mean it when he says email him and go see him, because uh, I, I took him up on it, it worked. So, so if you're in D.C., call him. All right. Um, we're about to conclude, but I'd like to first mention uh, how gratified we are to have so many previously elected fellows in the audience today. Uh, I want to take a moment to spe specifically recognize uh, two fellows who have been here for over, four, uh, for over 50 years, I'm told. 50 years. So 174 years of fellows, they've been fellows for 50 years. Uh, when I talk about standing on the shoulders of giants and, uh, and then you know, helping each other climb up that ladder, uh, these folks represent that. So let's specifically recognize Donald Ray and Frida Taub, uh, who have 50 years. Please stand up if you're here in the audience somewhere. There's, I see, I, I see them. <laughs> I'm told they are here. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for being here. And thank you all for, um, uh, for staying and, uh, and showing your respect to the new, the new class of fellows by, by being here and being supportive. Uh, again, I'm going to extend our congratulations to those of you who joined the ranks of the fellows. Uh, may you be here in 50 years. Uh, and then we're going to end by asking you to go forward and continue to fulfill our common mission of advancing science and serving society. Uh, we have a lot to do, and we need, we need uh, a force multiplier. We need scale, and that scale is in this room. Uh, you have students. 
you have faculty that, uh, that are with you. Uh, we have a lot to do over the next few years. Uh, we've got we've to interface with society. We've got to make sure that science is at every table. And you all are going to be able to do that because you are, uh, you're the champions of science in your communities and in your universities and at your uh, places of worship and at your Boy Scout, uh, Boy Scout troops and everywhere else. Uh, please bring science to those tables. And with that, let's go out and have another great day of the meeting. Thank you.